All right. First thing I will start with, uh, well, actually, my prayers that God works through me, that God speaks, and I don't say anything out of myself and only through Him. Amen. With that being said, I will start with a question. Who drives a car? Raise your hand. Okay, good, good. Keep your hands up. Now, out of those people, who changes the oil? Okay, so there's a lot less of you. Okay, but good. So I'll talk to you first. So you know that feeling when you're driving a car that has a lot, a lot, maybe probably over 1,000 miles in the car, then you get a fresh new oil change. Can you tell the difference? The car drives smoother, nicer, feels almost new, right? Okay, so that's more of an example for, uh, for men, I guess. But I have one for the women, too. So you probably have a old cutting board that's a seen days, and it's just, just in poor condition. And then you get a brand new cutting board. It's a brand new, the butcher block one, the wooden one, it's just nice, and you don't even want to cut on it, right? So if you haven't caught my drift, I'm talking today about old and new. The topic of my sermon is simple, old versus new. Now, we talked a little while ago, I looked at the calendar, I think it's been a month, if not more, since the last time we spoke on our topic of the Ephesians. And I would just like to remind you what comes before my sermon. So if we open up the Ephesians 4.20, and I'll just read through that so you have the general idea of what's coming afterwards. Because we're talking about, let's start with verse 20. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you have heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your formal way of life, the old self that is corrupted by the deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. One quick disclaimer. I uh, took the verses out of the uh, CSB, so if you see any discrepancies, it's still the same Bible, it's just a slightly different translation. All right, old versus new. The idea that Paul is uh, talking in these verses and continuing forward is about a Christian life. A Christian life before conversion and Christian life afterwards. A Christian life that uh, before the conversion is centered on the desires, uh, fulfillment of your own things that you want versus the new where you start to focus more on not yourself but other things, other people. And you start to do things and not do certain things. The idea that Paul is talking about here is a Christian is to discard the old self and to put on the new self. I mean, you can see it literally in uh, verses 22 through 24. Take off, be renewed, put on. Easy. Now, in verse 21, he says an interesting word, assuming. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that Paul is addressing in the next uh, uh, verses going forward, starting in 25 and onwards. They start, you will see them on the screen with a therefore. So I cannot proceed them without telling you what Paul said before. In verse 21, he talks about Christians who are maybe at best saved, but living carnally, living according to their flesh. At worst, it's an imitation of salvation, which really is pointless. So if we have the issue, we have the issue at hand, how can we solve it? Paul gives a very, very clear and very simple explanation. He gives the action, typically it's the action of the flesh, and then he gives the counteraction, the action of the spirit. Think of it as, don't do this, do this. So the first verse we're going to start is 25. Therefore, here's that word that I was talking about. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. 
Paul is talking here about lies. Lies, lies, lies. Why do we lie? Basic reasons. I made three. To make ourselves look better, a little exaggeration. I mean, it won't hurt anybody. Say I went to a fishing uh, trip yesterday. Uh, I didn't, but imagine I did. Um, and I got caught a fish and it was way big. It wasn't really, but I made an exaggeration. It's a lie. It's not what it was, but who will know? I made an exaggeration. I made myself look better than I'm a good fisherman. I am maybe uh, did something I did. Oh, it was an excellent job. Uh, maybe uh, tasting a dish. Well, it was great. The best dish I've ever tried, but it wasn't. So a little exaggeration. Another reason is to protect ourselves from the consequences. Say I mess up at work and then the boss comes around, oh, maybe angry, maybe not angry, but at least not happy. And they're saying, who did this? Who gets to be blamed? I said, no, 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 not me. It was the him. And another reason is to get what we want. I may lie, so I get whatever I want. That's another point we'll come across a bit later on. But Paul talks about lying, of course, is not a good thing. And if you look at our world, uh, in the time of uh, uh, when Paul was writing this letter to the Ephesians, they had the same issues as we do right now. Their mentality, the society mentality, was that lies are okay. And I think some of their proverbs actually carried over right now to our culture is that if there is gain in it for me, I will lie. I mean, if you, if you can uh, lie on your taxes, uh, you'll gain a little bit more money. What's harm in it? The government already has enough money, right? So all these little things, you can see the lies in politics. You can see it in media. You can see it in war propaganda. In fact, uh, one U.S. senator during the World War I said, it's a little bit paraphrased, it said slightly differently, but he said, the first victim of war is truth. Misinformation is everywhere. So one might think, okay, well, if it's everywhere, I mean, it's got to be okay, right? Well, we as Christians know that lying is not okay, but would you say that lying is harmless? If you look to Revelations 22, verse 15, it gives a very stark, stark explanation of lying. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Anyone who is lying is in the same category as murderers and sorcerers. Now, I will clarify that it's not if you ever lied. Well, actually, by God's principle, it's the same. But Paul is talking here about if you're habitually lying, if you're still lying and continuing the lying lifestyle, you're exactly in that category. The problem with lying is that Paul here in this verse is talking about uh, because we are members of one another. If we are a body and the body has to function, honesty has to be present. Truth has to be present. Imagine if you coming to a fireplace and you're touching the fire, yet your hand is telling you that it's cool. Reality of the fire and the heat does not change, yet your hand will tell you, no, 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 it's okay, it's good. It's actually not what it seems. So a body cannot properly function a church body cannot properly function if there's deceit, if there's lies, if there's untruthfulness in the, in the congregation. And I would say that Christians ought to be the most honest people on the planet. Christians ought to be the best people, the best workers, the most diligent ones. Why? Because it's not in our new nature. The old nature does call for lying. The old nature does say, yeah, you can do whatever you want but not the new one. And here's the issue. The new nature, the new uh, converted, saved nature calls for separating ourselves, to 
distance from the desires of the flesh and do want what is of the Spirit. Then Paul talks about, in verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Now, I have always read um, a version of the Bible that says, in anger do not sin, but I never really thought that it says you can't be angry. Problem is, do not sin in that anger. And uh, if anybody is interested, the definition of anger is strong feeling of displeasure. Innately, anger is not sinful. God has been multiple times angry in the Bible, but he never sinned. So here's the issue. It's not that you get angry, it's uh, how you get angry and what are the consequences of your anger. A Christian can be angry, sure, but that anger cannot be controlling the Christian. The anger has to be, um, anger, essentially the only way the Christian cannot sin in anger is if it's a reaction to sin. If you have a strong feeling of displeasure against sin, again, without sin. Because you can say that, yes, I have a strong, um, I'll give you an example. If you are walking down in a park and you see somebody beating up, beating down a kid, some teenager beating a kid, if you walk by without a thought in your head, that's bad. But a, uh, an anger that is acceptable by Paul here that is accepted by God is the strong feeling of displeasure that is towards this situation of injustice being done. But if you come to a person and start beating them up senselessly, you failed. So here's the issue. Anger is okay, but only if you do not sin in your anger. You got to deal with anger before it festers. For that reason, Paul actually gives a timer. And uh, um, sundown is not that far away, especially if uh, typically what you go to work, you come back, and then uh, if you have a, some kind of anger situation, you have until sundown to get it resolved. I wouldn't say uh, it's a literal timer that you have to resolve things before the sundown, but it says deal with it quickly. Deal with it quickly. Do not let it fester. I liked one translation that says, instead of give the devil an opportunity, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. I really like this word because it's a military term. Uh, I will give you an example. During World War II, when Nazis were controlling pretty much the entire Europe, the shores of um, um, France and all the way up to Great Britain, they were essentially impenetrable. It's, uh, uh, amphibian attacks are really, really difficult. Uh, for those who don't know, amphibian means by water. <laughs> and uh, these attacks, uh, while under control of the Nazis, essentially that place was in, in untouchable. They could not do anything. So what happened? D-Day, the Normandy beaches and other ones, what happened? A massive amphib amphibian attack by the Allies and they established a foothold on the beaches. From that base of operations, from that foothold, they were able to proceed to the rest of the Europe and essentially work towards the winning of the war. The exact same thing is happening in our life if we allow the devil to get a foothold in our life. And that cannot necessarily be through anger. Anger is just one of the ways we can let devil in our hearts. We can let him be there when you um, keep on to your lies, when you're getting angry, when we'll get to further steal, and essentially anything that is not approved by God, everything that goes against the spirit, everything goes to harm somebody else. That allows the devil to start to slowly, slowly gnaw at your self and to get you defeated afterwards. Speaking about stealing, verse 28, Paul is saying, let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with everyone in need. Paul 
like a, in prior situations, Paul is giving action and then a counteraction. The action of the flesh is to steal. The same way as we may lie to get what we want, stealing is a way to get items that we want. You tried lying, that didn't work, you might try stealing. You may have heard this proverb that says, uh, I'd rather ask forgiveness rather than permission. That's not a biblical one, but it's still pretty popular. It's the action of the flesh where you want something, you'll get it. Why? Because I want something. Paul here con contrasts that with a new man. If before you did everything for your own sake, stealing, lying, getting angry for no reason, or maybe with a reason but it's not righteous, the new man works. Interestingly enough, honestly, you do an honest work, you do truthfully, but here's the kicker. Not just for himself, but for the benefit of others. One thing that I probably always knew but never really looked at is that Paul here says that the old self, the old nature, the carnal uh, nature of people before they become Christians or even sometimes after, which is unfortunate, it's all centered on self. I at the center of it all, right? Not so with the new one. The idea is that by uh, a thief uh, satisfying his own needs, uh, satisfying whatever he wants to do, a person who was prior a, a thief will do honest work to provide for himself and to have something to share with someone in need. Now here, that's the difference. I mean, I'm sure it's not gonna be news to everybody, uh, uh, especially since we are a church. We do a lot of things to help each other. But that's the difference between the old man and the new man. Um, I would even say some Bibles have the little headers for the sections. And the entire section here was titled Rules of the New Life. I, wouldn't, I don't like the expression rules because rules are for a very specific thing. That's the issue with the uh, Quran because Quran believes that you have the exact words, exact situations have to be followed. Bible tells us the principles. So Paul gives you, okay, here you go, here are the principles. You've done that before, do not do that anymore. Or now you have to do this way. Again, the old is selfish, the new is generous. Then we continue going into the foul language. Verse 29, no foul language should come from your mouth but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Now, immediately you might think foul language, bad words. Four letter words, uh, different languages, maybe more words, but essentially bad words, the cuss words, everything that is uh, uh, frowned upon, right? True, true, but that's not the extent of it. Bad words, semi-bad words, even regular words, but they're used to belittle. You can call somebody a tree and that's gonna be belittling because if you're intending that with a harm, it's gonna be a foul language. Sarcasm, sarcasm is not okay for a Christian. Hopefully that's not a surprise for anybody. Interesting thing is uh, someone might say, well, Bible uses a lot of irony. Irony is very similar to uh, sarcasm because it's uh, an interesting expression that gets to the point of things. The problem with the sarcasm, it's an interesting expression to belittle somebody, to make myself be above somebody else. I'm going to use the words, I'm gonna play them I wouldn't say wisely, but I would use the words in such a way that it makes you, I guess, get belittled. That's a problem. Old way, old, uh, old flesh, 
old carnal person yes sure they have no restrictions on what they can or cannot do but not so in the christian no foul language interestingly enough is that uh, i've i was raised in a christian um, family since birth and i'm probably a fourth generation christian so foul language is a big no 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 in our family but it doesn't mean i have never used foul language even jesus in the gospels he's saying call somebody a fool you already deserve to be beaten to death somebody call somebody stupid and they you deserve to be killed words matter when i was uh, thinking about what uh, the foul language and the uh, the tongue and the words one image came to my mind in isaiah uh, chapter 6 if you remember when isaiah uh, visits the throne of god when he sees the vision of that place do you remember the words that he said he said woe to me i am undone i am a man of dirty feet right yes no okay guys you got to read this over no it's not isaiah says there woe to me i am undone i am a man of unclean unclean lips and then he actually continues to say living among the people a nation of unclean lips now think about it a uh, prophet isaiah was not a man of the potty mouth he was a prophet telling god's words to his people yet this man a god's man is saying that i am a man of unclean lips when i thought about that i think it's the holy spirit opening up to me is, is saying that you max are using your words not to glorify me any way that you're saying anything that might be not to the benefit of somebody else you're not glorifying me through that important thing to notice here is that paul says reprimandation is okay you can reprimand somebody but it has to be in love it doesn't mean that um, in the verse that but only what is good for building up somebody in need that we can only say nice things and nothing else no you can't reprimand you can't even be harsh but it has to be coming from a loving heart and it has to be received by the person who you reprimanded So in the last three verses, Paul kind of summarizes what he talked about. Verse 30, and do not grieve the God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of the redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. Interesting to note entire bible grieving the holy spirit is mentioned only once here holy spirit is not a force holy spirit is not an in uh, inanimate well he is an animal he's a spiritual being but he is a person holy spirit can be grieved by our actions or sometimes inactions the Holy Spirit can be grieved by lying. We talked about it earlier. By anger, or uh, more like how we get into anger. By theft, foul language. And Paul just pretty much says, oh, bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander. Imagine shouting. If you're loud, if you're shouting, if, even if you use normal words, you may be grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, Bible says that tongue is an uncontrollable evil. I like an expression that says, word is not a bird. Once it gets out, you cannot catch it. Anything that we say cannot be undone. And it's so true in the spiritual world. verse 32 and be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ 
This verse essentially just summarizes everything. You've been old nature before. You've had this unrepentant, selfish nature that only con concerns with themselves and nothing else. Now you have a nature of spirit. That changes everything. A person who is a Christian, a converted person, a saved person, it's a, home, it's a person who is a home to the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a person who can, by their action or inaction, grieve the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, if you're doing things right, if you're following what God is leading you to, if you're following the recommendations or uh, prompts that your, the Holy Spirit tells you, don't do this or do that, you're, getting, you're becoming a better person. You're becoming more like Christ. And you're able to then pass this on grace to somebody else. The very sad thing to say uh, that I've heard is when you're talking to somebody and say, oh yes, I'm a Christian. Two are the worst things that I could ever hear is, one is uh, what church you're from, why? Because I don't want to, I don't want to know anybody from that church. Maybe one person, maybe it's a family, maybe it's a whole church, hopefully not. But we can't give a bad rap to ourselves, to Christians. And then when somebody is coming around and trying to plant the seed, we get a response. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to associate with you. You give bad name to Christians. Maybe not you necessarily, but uh, because I've had bad experiences with these so-called Christians, no, 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 I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything with them. And that makes everything harder. Let's say if you have a neighbor that says, I do not trust Christians. Yes, they can see that you live your life as a good Christian. You have to work extra hard because somebody else gave a bad reputation to us. There's nothing you can do about it. It just makes it harder for us. So it's just another reminder for every Christian to live an according life. Do not live according to the old self. Do not live according to the deceit, selfishness, but live according to the new life. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is one of the two things that Jesus answered when he was asked, what are the, what are the most important commandments? He said, love God, that comes first, and then love your neighbor. Any action that does not show love or care for your neighbor is not going to be of the new nature. It's going to be of the old one. Best example that I can think of is a person who is living, uh, is a saved person, but living according to their old nature is a prisoner who obtained freedom. And they're free, but they go outside of the prison they still wear the prison clothes, they still have a tent up a prison wall, and they still live like they are in prison. Why? What's worse is that if a person is imitating Christianity, there's nothing worse than a life spent imitating Christianity. You wasted everything. In the end, you still get nothing. just as God also forgave you. For me, these are the biggest words of this entire passage. Just as God forgave you, forgive somebody else. There's nothing that somebody can do against you that's bigger than you, what you've done against God, what I've done, what every person has done against God. By that logic, pass on the grace. Just as God gave you, forgave you in Christ, we're only blameless before God if we're in Christ. That is our only salvation. And I hope that every person present here is blameless before God in Christ. Christ is our only salvation. He is our Lord and Savior. And we hope to see him soon in our, uh, once we get to heaven. But it is a stark reminder to those who are not. There's nothing good waiting at the end of their life. Death is not the end.
with those cheerful moments, I would like to, for us to stand up and to praise God and to pray Him, to pray to Him, to give Him gratitude for the things that He has given to us, that He has given us the Holy Spirit that is working through us, renewing us, changing us. We're no longer those who do the old way. We're no longer those who do things according to what we want. The new order is in. If you have a desire, you may pray so. Otherwise, I will conclude.